Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the More Right Rudder podcast. NAFI would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor of this episode, Lightspeed. NAFI members have access to two unique programs offered by Lightspeed that can save you hundreds on your next headset purchase. To learn more, go to go.lightspeedaviation.com slash NAFI. There's also a link in the show notes. Listeners to this podcast can also receive a $10 discount on their NAFI membership, whether you are joining for the first time or renewing. Use the code POD49 P-O-D, at checkout. That's POD49. Also, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast anywhere you get your podcast from and visit nafinet.org for more details and to join or renew. On to the show. Welcome to another episode of the More Right Rudder podcast, the podcast for flight instructors on the go. I'm Sarah Stout, the Program Development Manager here at NAFI, the National Association of Flight Instructors. Joining me today is Tammy Barlett. She's an Air Force veteran with instructional experience in a variety of manned and unmanned aircraft. Today, Tammy owns and operates a company called Crosscheck that offers an online course for pilots that teaches mental performance and confidence building. Welcome, Tammy. We're so happy you're here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So tell us, tell us your story. How did you get into the Air Force and what led you down the instructional path? Yeah, it's an interesting story because honestly, flying was not on my radar at all. And it was simply because I, I just grew up not knowing any pilots. I did grow up thinking I could be whatever I wanted to be. I truly did believe that. And so when I started looking into the military, someone suggested the Air Force and I got to Air Force ROTC and this is not a surprising question, but to me it was surprising because I really hadn't thought about it. They said, well, do you want to be a pilot? And I, I thought, oh, I've, I never considered this before because of what I told you, I had no exposure and I, it took me about two seconds and I thought, absolutely, that sounds amazing. I was a gymnast, a roller coaster kid, a tree climber it sounded perfect to have an office in the sky, right? And so I pursued that during ROTC. And then I went to pilot training at Laughlin Air Force Base. And that's really where it all began. Great. That sounds it's such a fun way to start. So many people ask that backstory, you know, was, was someone in your family a pilot? And, and I'm the same way. I'm like, nope, <laughs> just, a, just a thing <laughs> that happened. Um, all right. So th- tell us about some of your experiences in the military that led you to develop this program for, for pilots. Well, my first job I went, so when I went through pilot training, we initially started in the T-37. That's what everybody flew at the time. And now it's the T-6. But then you transition on to the next aircraft, and I was selected selected to continue on flying in the T-38, which is the fighter bomber track. And when I graduated, most people ended up going to a fighter or bomber, but I got selected to stay on as an instructor pilot at Laughlin and teach in the T-37, which isn't as glorious as going on to fly an F-16 or an F-15 or an A-10. But what I discovered was that it was the perfect job for me. I had a lot of growing to do, not knowing that I just got into the aviation world, and I learned that I loved teaching. And so I taught in the in the T-37 for several years. I moved on to the A-10, flew that for several years. Um, I had cervical spine reconstruction, which is what put me into the unmanned platform. So I flew the MQ-1 and the MQ-9 and went to weapons school in that platform. And then I I got a waiver for my neck. Uh, my spine surgery. And I went back into the T-38 and flew in a high G environment teaching in the T-38 for the last six and a half years. And honestly, that is where this whole concept um, of my mental performance training business started, but I didn't even realize it because what had happened was that I realized that 
it wasn't always the stick and rudder instruction that was so impactful that I learned that the mindset training I offered them without even really realizing that's what I was doing had a bigger impact on the trajectory than sometimes just that stick and rudder instruction, because oftentimes it was their mind that was in their way. And so if I could get their head out of their way so they could actually learn the stuff they were being taught, they could excel much quicker. And that's kind of where it all got ignited. Yeah, I I agree with you there that the mindset's a big challenge for a lot of pilots. They're either unsure or they're lacking confidence or, you know, certainly I had struggles. A lot of people do. And, you know, even when we're mentoring new flight instructors, we give them the guidance that, you know, you're, you're a part-time psychologist now. And <laughs> so you, you've got to getting into those minds and understanding, you know, their motivations, their fears and, and all of that can be really helpful in getting them past, you know, even if they are struggling with those stick and rudder skills, it's not necessarily a, a motor skill thing. It could be, yeah, mentally they're in their own way. Right. So a lot of your mental you know, model and training that you've developed is preparing pilots for the unknown. Flight instructors certainly face that all the time. We all have sporty experiences of, of students doing something interesting. And so can you talk us through a bit of your mental model and how that's helping flight instructors? Yeah. So the first thing, like you mentioned already, is preparation. So obviously preparation is key. And preparing for the expected, that's kind of a given. Preparing for the unexpected, that takes it to the next level. And so I'll talk a little bit about that, but also preparing mentally how you want to react, feel, and think when the unexpected happens. And that's where it truly can pay off. Because as pilots, like you said, especially as instructor pilots, we can be in some very unexpected situations. But if we expect those things to happen and have a plan on how we want to react, and honestly think through and practice, you know, when, when I have this feeling, cause you might not know exactly what that unexpected situation is, but if you think through how you want to react, you know, how you want to keep your composure, where you're going to put your eyes, you know, what are you going to focus on that you're much more likely going to do it in the situation and maintain your composure. So, I mean, some of it is just picking the most likely what ifs, whether, you know, whether it's just a, what if that could be an emergency or it's a what if that your student something your student might do unexpectedly you can think through the most likely what ifs step by step as if you're in that moment you know what i mean of one version of chair flying right maybe a more of a combination of visualization chair flying cuz in my opinion chair flying is more the switches and the buttons and visualization is more actually putting yourself like feeling it in the moment and how you're going to process through it so if you process through that and you you like build up an arsenal of different scenarios that you're processing through, what'll happen is that even if those scenarios don't happen, you will be more likely to respond more composed in any unknown situation because you've kind of practiced and put in, put yourself in those scenarios. Yeah, I like your discussion on the difference between chair flying and visualization because so many times, even starting with you know, a primary student, they're just getting in the airplane for the first time, we say, oh, you know, take home your cockpit poster and, and chair fly. And that's really what it is, is, is developing that motor and that muscle memory of, okay, the battery master's over here, the light switch is over here, that type mm -hmm. of thing, that, that visualization is where that really mental element comes in and working through those, those scenarios. Uh, so the being prepared is the first part of your uh, your model. And then the second part, go ahead and talk us through that. Yeah. The second part is the enemies within. So I think what happens to a lot of people is when they have a struggle or specifically maybe a failure, or a really big one, oftentimes people will just shove the, the feelings that come with that down and they bury it. And it, the way I like to describe it is if you continue to do that, those enemies within will eventually rise up and they will take over and unexpectedly. And, you know, we, we don't want that to happen. So it's really important that first of all, people process through those, those failures, whether it's an instructor who felt they made a mistake or their student, they have to process to me. So I would go, when I had a failure, I would, I would 
maintain my composure, obviously maintain professionalism, but I needed to deal with the failure and how it felt. So I would go home and as much as intellectually, I wanted to just put myself back in the books and study, something always stopped me. Something always said, nope, you need to deal with this. You need to deal with the, how this feels. And so whether that's, you know, working out, crying, journaling, punching something, not someone find what it is that lets you release that so that you can move forward through that failure or that struggle much more quickly. Because if you don't let that go, what happens is it's almost like running a race with a weight vest. You don't, you wouldn't run a race with a weight vest. So this is you taking off that weight vest so you can get through the struggle much quicker. And then you can get back in the books or get back into whatever it is you need to do. And the other thing that applies to that is when we have a failure, you know, I like to say, strive for perfection, but don't be a perfectionist. So on the backside of whatever it is you're doing, whatever maneuver it is you're trying to do or what you're trying to accomplish, if it doesn't go the way you want to, that's okay figure out why instead of taking that taking that frustration turn it into curiosity because we can learn so much from our failures and i know we hear that a lot but what does that mean it means that we dig through that failure to find out find the gem and i know not everyone is some people may be watching on video some people won't but most people i have a bowl here most people keep their failures inside a bowl that has you know, the, a bunch of junk in it. And we carried around, go, oh my gosh, look what I did. I can't believe I did this. When the truth is, is that we need to process our failures through a strainer. And ultimately what we're trying to do is strain out the gem of information that's in that. Because sometimes those mistakes we make are something that saves someone else in the future or saves us in the future. And we need to, you know, develop that curiosity. So it kind of all blends into one processing through emotionally, and then taking a a view of curiosity towards it. Yeah, we hear so much in this industry to to learn from the mistakes of others. And a lot of times we'll even put emphasis on, you know, others accidents and, and learning from those. And yeah, we hear, you know, reflect on your mistakes, but it's not not to the the depth that that your model goes into, which is really a valuable model, because of, of course every time we make a mistake, there's something to to be learned uh, with that. And the curiosity model is is something I really like, because you don't hear curiosity associated with mistakes and, and errors too frequently. Um, you know, you say learn from it, and but then that next level deeper of why did this happen, and and why. Could this happen to somebody else? Could this happen to me again? Um, and just continuing to extend that thought process could be very valuable for, for flight instructors. Um, and I love your little analogy with the, the strainer and the bowl. <laughs> so it's, it's great, simple, <laughs> but it's something we all relate to. Uh, we all have those things floating around and uh, we, we know their job. All right, so your model has one more element. Tell us about the last one. Yeah, the last one is, it's it's the Z. So the acronym is actually PEZ, prepare, enemies within, and the Z is zone. So get in the zone. Basically what it is, is once you determine that your goal is something that you want to achieve, you've you know processed it through your personal core values. And if you haven't figured those out, I highly suggest that you do. I didn't do it till I was about 42. And it was super helpful because it kind of helps you filter out what things you should be going after and what things you shouldn't be necessarily going after. And it can make your plate less full for those of you who have too much on your plate. But the bottom line is once you determine a goal is what you want, you know, and and you you should help your students do that too, right? Um, You develop a no quit mentality. And I like to say, fail out before you bail out. Again, going back to the failure and not being afraid of that failure because honestly, sometimes it looks like you're, if you feel like you're running towards a failure and you want to quit, you might think you're seeing a cliff that you're just about to run off of. But what, what might happen is right before that cliff, you take a hard right hand turn because you figure it out and it, you have this beautiful view that you would have never seen had you not just barreled towards that failure. And it's just so important to do that. Now, when it comes specifically in the aircraft, you know, how do you get over those failures and those struggles? I wanted to highlight this because this is something more usable you can take away. 
people always say, and instructors are always saying, you know, you got to let the mistakes go. You got to get over it. Don't grade yourself, yada, yada, yada. Like we all hear that, right? But it's the how, how do you make that happen? And there's more, I go into depth in my course that can teach a person how to get over mistakes. But the, one of the quickest things I can just throw out there right now is to shift your mindset instead of the, what if, what if this happens or why did that happen to what now? What now, what now, what now? And it sounds very simple, but it's a shift in where your mind is thinking because it's so important as pilots, we're in the moment. We are not going, I can't believe that just happened. Did I just bust this check ride? You're, those are wasted thoughts and you're using up tons of thought energy that you need to focus on what you're focusing on. When I was a student in pilot training, I remember them telling us, don't grade yourself. Don't grade yourself. Don't grade yourself. And I thought, why would I grade myself? I don't even know what the grades are supposed to be. I'm just trying to survive here. And so it didn't make any sense in my mind. I went up for an instrument check ride and this isn't a, like a, this isn't an official check ride. It was just an like inside of pilot training check ride. And it was my instrument check ride and we were doing fix to fixes, which I don't think most people do anymore, but they're terrible and complicated and just stressful. It doesn't matter what they are, but the bottom line is, is when I hit holding and I turned, my mind went, oh my gosh, I just turned the wrong direction. I can't believe I just turned the wrong direction, but it's one of those things you don't, I had already started it. I wasn't going to turn the other way. And so I kept the turn going and I did holding and you know, that's something a lot of people do still, right? Are we entering, entering holding properly, right? That heading, is it the right heading? Um, uh, and anyway, so I'm sitting and holding and I'm thinking, I just busted this. I can't believe I just busted my instrument check ride. And I did the holding and then I started the approach and I'm on the ILS and I'm still half my brain is sitting back and holding going, oh my gosh, how stupid. And all of a sudden I'm, you know, I'm configuring for the approach and the instructor or the, the value pilot goes, um, did you want to put your flaps down? <laughs> and I was like, okay, now I, now I definitely busted this check ride. Like this check ride's over. And I still had to do another approach. It was brutal. And it was funny because we get back to the debrief and the, the value pilot goes, it was Friday afternoon. You were my third check ride of the day. Everything started off great. And I thought, wow, I got three awesome check rides in one day. But then I don't know what happened. And I just sunk into my chair because I thought, oh God, that's awful. And I, I failed. I did fail. But what the interesting thing is that I did not fail for holding. I had actually turned the right way. And because my brain was stuck, quote, grading myself. So this is where I learned what it meant. Like they weren't actually thinking. I'm very, I'm very like, it is what it is. I, I think very, you know, like, what they say is what they mean. So I was taking it very literally, but they meant don't, don't grade yourself. Don't think I failed. Like you got to move on. And that's just an example of a, a, what a lot of people I'm sure do, where we're stuck in the moment going, I can't believe it. And again, how do you get over those things? There's there's more techniques than just what now, but that's something that's simple. You can start thinking, what now? What now? What am I doing now? Right. Force yourself to come back to the moment. And and I'm sure there's not a pilot out there who hasn't had a moment like you experienced, you know, and unfortunately on a check ride, but yeah. um, plenty of us have yeah. had that, uh, that too. Um, I've certainly made a, a faulty turn here or there in, in the training days. Um, yeah. And uh, you brought up an important element uh, that we wanted to talk more about, which was the debrief and focusing mm -hmm. on that's a great time because um, we've always kind of called the airplane the world's worst classroom. You know, you're moving fast. You don't have time. You have to stay in the moment, whether you're ready mm -hmm. or not, or that instructor needs to take over and and get you there for you. But the debrief really becomes kind of your safe space. Airplanes put back in the hangar, everything's done. It's just you and your instructor sitting at the table. And we can really dig deep there. So what would what are some of your suggested techniques and ideas for strongly utilizing a debrief? Well, the first thing that's important about a debrief is that it's really difficult to do a a debrief properly if you didn't start with 
object, um, you know, objectives in the beginning that you have that you're shooting for. Because if you don't set the student up with, hey, the, this is our main objective today. We're going to do a bunch of things, but I want you to focus like today we're going to focus on landings. And specifically, we're going to try and be plus or minus this on final and you know, land within this much feet, like some tangible things you can do. Um, obviously, in a flight, there's lots more things. But if the student is trying to they don't know what to focus on. They're trying to focus on everything. A lot of times nothing gets better. So it starts in the brief with setting objectives and what your focus is. So then you come back to the debrief and let's say you're, you, that day you work, you work on landings and then maybe stalls. Like those are your two focus points. Cause you can only have so much for a student to focus on. Um, it gives you a starting point. Hey, did we achieve these things? If they're measurable, you can you can use that. Hey, were we plus or minus whatever on final? Or did we land within the first X? Do we meet our objectives? How did that go? And if we didn't, the question is why? It's not just you didn't, because that's not helpful to anybody. And sometimes in that debrief, it's really important for the instructor to not just assume that they know why. Sometimes you really do, and, and, and some instructors know this and some don't, but it's really important to get inside of their head to understand why they did what they did. For example, there was a student I had, and, and this might not be exactly the scenario anymore because it's been a while, but I remember I was, we were, he was struggling with his flair. And instead of just saying, you, you did it wrong and then telling him how I wanted him to do it, I said, tell me what you're thinking. And he said some stuff, and then all of a sudden he goes, and then when I see 10 feet on the radar altimeter, and I was like, what? He's like, that's when he was going to flare. I was like, oh, oh, no, no, like that is not, that's not how we do this. <laughs> but if I hadn't asked him that he would have continued to do that. So in the debrief, it's really important that it's, it's interactive. So you get to the true root cause and you get to what I say, the facts, you got to pull out the facts, trying to dig out what really happened because oftentimes more often than not, and we, a lot of instructors know this, the first instinctual why is not the actual reason why. If you dig, why did you do that? Well, wh why did you, until you get to a point where we really can't why it anymore. And then the other thing is leaving the debrief with a tangible next time I will. So in weapons school, we would write on the board N-T-I-W, next time I will. And that's for the student. Like you want the student to say next time I will, and you give them something very tangible. And sometimes it's just your best guess of what you think is going to work to fix this problem, but they have something they can do instead of just being told that was wrong. This was wrong. That was wrong. So back again to the curiosity, right? You're trying to be a detective, like find the root cause, like treat it like that. Cause it, I think it's more fun that way. Cause every student is different. Right. And, and it's not motivating at all for a student to just hear, well, this was wrong and that was wrong and, and giving them that chance to, to dig in and it can help their understanding. And certainly, you know, like with your, your radar altimeter example, that's a great way to flush out. Well, you know, they, maybe had, you know, in, in the modern civilian training, a lot of times I've heard, well, I saw the, you know, on so-and-so's YouTube channel. Well, ah. um, <laughs> well you know, yeah. that, that might work for them in that scenario, but you know, they, they simply don't know any better or they might be applying, right. um, you know, it sounds like, like your, uh, your pilot maybe had experience in a different aircraft where that was appropriate and it's not appropriate in the aircraft you're flying now. I, I've certainly done, uh, you know, step up training for high performance or uh, some of the training I did where people actually struggle the most sometimes was stepping down into or what we would call down into a light sport aircraft. And it was a mm. whole different world and and things like that. The flare were different and uh, how even how you approach the landing was was wildly different than you would in something like a typical trainer. So yeah. digging into that and then helping them understand those differences and characteristics and being curious on what, what were you thinking here? It's like, no, I have ideas based on what I've seen other people do. Right. But yeah, yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean your experience is, is the same. Yeah. And then you got the outsider's perspective. Like we're talking about setting objectives, right? Let's say your, your, your objective that day is to work on landings and approach, you know, from multiple different angles, meaning like you're not always going to have the perfect approach to your landing, right? So let's say that day you're going to go out and practice it from different angles. And 
maybe and learn how to maybe you need to correct or maybe you need to that's the point you need to go around if someone's observing you and they see you go around go around go around go around and then you only get like a couple landings you might walk out of that aircraft walk by that person they'll be like hey god you're really struggling today i guess that was a rough ride when truly knowing if they don't know what your goals were that might have been exactly what you're hoping to do because you're trying to show them or they're trying to learn different, you know, different angles of approach so that when you get into scenarios that aren't perfect, what do you do? How do you make the decision? So again, if, if someone doesn't know the objectives and the overall objective and goal of the flight, they, they don't know if you actually met the objectives or not, but you do. Right. And having a clear objective is so critical and communicating that up front. That was a good point that you made. Uh, I was just talking to a NAPI member yesterday who was is taking over a student who had been working with someone who was just kind of showing up at the airplane every day. Here's what we're going to do. They didn't have a clear cut thing. We were talking about curriculum and, you know, how do you communicate and what offers, you know, okay, you know, so in this first block of training, all right, you know, we take the ACS and we essentially double it. So now you've got you know, plus or minus 20 or something. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. something like like that. And if they know what they're working towards and their standards, they're going to be much, uh, much better able to one, get towards that goal and even assess themselves as they're doing it. It's not really valuable learning if they don't even know what they're working towards. And you're just doing stuff over and over and right. just magically hoping they'll get better and not knowing they don't know what their target is. Yeah, if you try and if you try to focus on too many things, it's hard for them to get better. So that's why the yeah. focus points, not that you're not going to do those other maneuvers, but that might not just be the focus for today. So they, they can right. hone in on something instead of being overwhelmed with too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's important too, to keep it keep it focused and keep it a length of time that they won't get overwhelmed and burned right. out. Uh, mm -hmm. as well yeah. to help them best achieve those objectives. I've, I've, I've certainly done some marathon <laughs> training, <laughs> uh, training flights, and you do get burned out and lose, uh, you know, focus on that objective. Um, and mm -hmm. then when you get to that debrief, I personally haven't always found it as valuable because you're just tired. Yeah, you are. And, and so doing all that. Um, one other topic you have brought up, uh, is problem solving as part of your model. So can you talk us through a little bit of your thought process with problem solving? Yeah, well, I mean, it's important that you, we always, again, kind of, it's going back to that root cause and what is causing the pro the problem. So that it, it, it ties into the whole curiosity thing that we've been talking about. And so I just think it's it's important that we put on that, again, that detective hat and go, well, what, what is really causing this? And then once you figure it out, that plan to go forward. And the other thing too, that kind of ties into this is sometimes the problem is maybe the, it, it can be the instructor. Um, and I, I mean that in the kindest way, meaning that I've been that I've been there too, because what I'm getting at is sometimes when we're flying and we feel a lot of emotion towards the student, we're getting frustrated with the student. Um, oftentimes we don't go into problem solving mode because we're getting overtaken by some of these emotions of frustration. And usually that happens when we're getting a little bit outside of our comfort zone as instructors. Sometimes we don't know our own lines and we don't, we, we think because instructor X who has this many hours does this, that we should let it go that far or whatever. And we each individually need to draw those lines ourselves to find out where we, we should you know, take the aircraft, well, how much should we let them do? So if you find yourself not going into problem solving mode and being a little bit more emotional, it's probably because things have gone outside of where you're comfortable and it's time to maybe go back and determine where your boundaries are for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and in addition to, you know, performance characteristics and, and boundaries, even you know, even things like bias can creep in, you know, like, oh, you know, I've told this student this, why are, you know, in, and, and, and sometimes instructors, you know, when you spend so much time with someone, you kind of see what you want to see to a point and then, or yeah. what you expect to see. And then mm -hmm. when that doesn't work out again, I, that's where that frustration can build. So certainly 
um, getting in that problem solving mode. I, I've absolutely had other instructors fly with my students when I'm like, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I, I think I know this is what I've told them, or at least I think I told them. And that can help. And, and I've been that instructor who's who's hopped in an airplane with someone else's student and, and all those factors can play a role. Yeah, sometimes I think we don't, um, you know, it's it's okay when when we get to a point where we're, we're getting frustrated, maybe it's time for them to fly with a different student because maybe the way we're explaining it isn't, you know, maybe we've tried three different ways and we don't have a fourth option. And that's when the frustration comes in because we don't have another option to help them. So it's totally okay to, you know, have them fly with another instructor. In fact, I think that shows wisdom in your instructor ability. And the other thing that keep in mind um, when it comes to students, I think it's important for instructors to consider this is that if we go back to the strainer model, um, as far as and using it in kind of a different sense, when 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 people learn information, you can think of their brain like a strainer. Uh, and, you know, it, it collects some of the information and some of it falls through, right? We don't, you get sit in a classroom and you only soak up what 20% of what, what was told. I mean, I don't know what the actual content is, but, and everyone's different, right? And our, all of our, if you think of our brains as strainers, everyone's strainer is different. So someone who might be really, really good at landings might not understand aerodynamics. And let's say we're really good with aerodynamics. And it's very simple for us. It's not, it may not be, we can't understand why they don't get it. But the truth is, is that some, everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. So if you picture that strainer, some people might have a big hole in one corner and then a strainer for the rest of it. So the, the content needs to be, and if you keep dropping stuff through, it's going to fall through the hole. So you need to, if you, if you can picture the strainer with a hole on one side, you need to tilt the strainer so the stuff doesn't fall through, right? And that to me is explaining it differently, getting a different instructor, trying a new angle. Um, don't just keep saying it the same way because everybody learns different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th they do. And so even, uh, even just hearing someone different say it nearly the same way, sometimes they just connect with that person differently. Yeah. And, and, and then the dots wrong with that. magically yeah. connect. Um, yeah, it, it's a fantastic tool. Um, and, and I've certainly seen, yeah, magic like that happen. Just because, you know, you debrief with the other instructor and they're like, oh, I just went through the checklist with this. And they're like, I've done that 4,000 times. <laughs> but it, it magically connected with that other person. And, and sometimes just having something different, getting a different opinion, it's all such a super strong tool uh, and definitely something to keep in your toolkit. And I love your your strainer analogy. You said that. <laughs> uh, Me and my strainers. <laughs> I, it's it's a great one though. It's something you know I'm connecting to it very easily and, and understanding exactly what you mean. Um, so before we wrap up for today, could you give us like a 30 second overview of uh, your cross check course and what that could offer pilots and instructors particularly? Yeah, I would be happy to. Yeah, the course is really built for anyone. I've had zero hour students. I've had a four thousand hour CFI, and you take what you you know what you can get out of it, what you put in, what you get out. So the focus is basically on boosting confidence, enhancing focus, reducing stress, and increasing safety. There's a particular focus on defeating perfectionism, increasing confidence, learning how to get over failures, learning how to deal with anxiety, <laughs> which a lot of people struggle with, and then ultimately increasing focus so people are more present in the moment. Great. It sounds like a great course and it's entirely online. It is online. It's a, it's a four week program where there's 45 minutes to an hour of recorded video content. They watch each week on their own time. There's some action items, which isn't really homework. It's just things to change inside of how you operate to make things a little bit smoother with how you think and process um, through content. And then the last thing is we have a record, we record it. We have a discussion group at the, at the end of the week, two times are offered for different, you know, so people's schedules can accommodate and it is recorded. So they do get one-on-one -on -one time with a coach, which more often than not is me, but I do have other coaches. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for taking your time today and just giving us a little preview of the course and these mental models. I think this will be fantastic for flight instructors. And we'll certainly link to your website in the show notes and pilots should go check that out. Thank you again so much, Tammy. Thank you. And I really, I should just clarify, I think I just said one-on-one -on -one time. It's group, it's a discussion group. 
So I just want to make sure that's clear. I don't want people thinking they well one-on-one coaching sessions, but yes, thank you for having me. I very much appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the More Right Runner podcast. Tammy's insights on getting and staying into the mental game are valuable for all instructors and pilots. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to receive every episode. Also, check out nafinet.org to join or renew and use the code POD49 for your $10 discount.